My name is Dave Thorpe, I'm a HR business partner at Dairy Crest and uh, I've kindly been invited by both Lisa and Maureen this morning to kind of talk about how I've approached kind of engaging with staff uh, both from an operational perspective but also in my role as a HR business partner. So I've come from a commercial background and made the transition into HR about two and a half years ago um, and I just wanted to kind of share with you some of kind of the approaches that have worked for me um, and the, the results that it's had on kind of both the team that I manage but um, from a performance perspective as well. But before I do that, um, I just thought I'd give you a bit of background about the company that I work for. So, Dairy Chris uh, is, a, is the UK's leading dairy company. Um, it has a turnover of 1.4 billion. Um, it's got circa four to four and a half thousand employees. Um, and we operate out of 10 manufacturing sites across the UK and also have our head office, uh, corporate head office in Asia. So my role, um, I work out of our Asia head office supporting the commercial marketing functions. The basis of our business, uh, obviously the massive milk side to our business, of which that billion turnover, one billion of that is, is on milk. Um, but it's about focus on um, a, a generation of added value products. So you'll see here, some of some of the brands that we produce at Cathedral City, <coughs> number one to UK cheese, worth about 283 million as a brand. Um, and we've obviously got Country Life, Clover, uh, and Fridge Milkshakes. So we've got a branded side to our business, but then we also have our traditional doorstep, um, uh, which is your, your milkman, which is um, which is disappearing from, from the English streets, unfortunately. Um, and we've had to move with the times in terms of growing that proposition and the technology um, in terms of uh, engaging with consumers around uh, technology. So you'll probably find that one in three households uh, has a Dairy Crest brand in their fridge. Any hands up anyone that's got a Dairy Crest brand in their fridge? Excellent. Okay. You're keeping me in a job at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's gone great. Okay, it's the, the slide's not actually showing what I wanted to show, but effectively what I wanted to show here was how uh, my role has evolved and developed um, in Dairy Press. So I joined in 2005 as a territory manager, um, and territory managers from a tiering perspective kind of sit at your, your technical stage of, of, of your career. I then moved into an area manager role where I was managing a team of circa six, seven people. And that's kind of moving from your technical to, to your more your, your managerial. And then in 2009, I, um, I moved into a national field sales controller role, which effectively is heading up a team of 20 across the whole of the UK. Um, and that's moving more from a kind of management to a strategic thinking uh, role. So as part of a senior commercial leadership team. And then ultimately, the sat above me is your thought leaders. So my group commercial director, uh, Exec MD and, uh, and obviously the CEO, uh, some of whom I'm supporting now from a business partner perspective. So just in, uh, a bit of background about what field sales does. Um, so I had a team of 20 that effectively uh, went around the whole of the country, visiting all of the major uh, supermarkets at Tesco, as the Sainsbury's Morrison's. And the, the reason that we visit um, those stores is that we spend a massive amount of money investing in promotions with those retailers, it's millions. And you will not believe the disciplines that happen at store, or the fact that we could pay millions for a promotion and it's not activated at store. So my team were, I guess, there to make sure that those are being enacted at store, but it's also about trying to build relationships <coughs> with those store managers to leverage the strength of our brands um, and, and uh, obviously create more sales um, going through consumers. So. It was focused on four key pillars, so availability, making sure that our product was um, uh, available at point of purchase. It was about visibility, so increasing display, because ultimately the more space you've got at point of purchase, the less chance it is of that product going off sale. Um, from a display perspective, you'll, you'll walk down the centre of an aisle in, in a supermarket and you'll see these gondola ends. Um, that's the prime piece of, of space that you have in a, in a supermarket and, and, and suppliers pay an immense amount of money. And my team were in there about trying to leverage, giving additional space to our brands. And then from a supplier perspective is about how do we uh, resolve supplier issues at, 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 uh, at the stores. 
So, I, I, what I wanted to do was just kind of give you a bit of background as to how I've been managed and how it's impacted my approach both as a manager but also um, given me a really good um, back, backdrop to moving into HR. So, when I joined the company, um, we were a team of six. Um, we had a national field sales manager who had come from a, a management background, hadn't necessarily worked at, a, at a kind of a technical role and hadn't necessarily transitioned through different roles. And her style was very much JFDI of Tell, um, which in some respects had its, uh, had its benefits, but in others it didn't. Um, and I found um, working for her both as a manager but also as a territory manager, I found it's quite... Um, quite difficult in terms of she was very hands-on, but she, she wouldn't give you any power or autonomy to be able to make decisions. So Maureen was talking earlier on about kind of management being able to have that autonomy to be able to make decisions. I found that when I moved to report to a different boss who gave me that space, it really did help me. Um, from an empathy perspective, not much empathy. So this individual was very, very driven. Um, talking about kind of knowing your team and knowing their families. A lot of them had families. Um, and obviously there's going to be times where it's going to be challenging in terms of juggling child, um, child, uh, child care. Um, but this individual was kind of, I don't want to hear about that. You're here to do a job and you get your paid by this company and I expect you to be here on time and, and do your hours. From an empowerment perspective, very little power. It was very much held at the top. Um, and from a career perspective, well, I guess career wasn't even in the, the dictionary. It was all about performance, it was all about KPIs, it wasn't necessarily about training and development. Um, and I guess that for me, um, as a territory manager, led to people exiting. So we had turnover, and it was quite high towards the end when I, um, uh, when I was starting to move up to, into an area manager role. You start to get the disengagement, um, so people starting to kind of um, talk negatively, and particularly in a, in, a, in a team that are regionally based, a lot of them were speaking over the phone, and that can be really difficult when you're constantly getting that negative chit chat, um, when particularly in a role when you're working on your own. Obviously, from a performance perspective, we obviously had that peak, but then it started to drop off. And I think ultimately where we got to was kind of a fear culture. So people were almost at a point where they were almost fearful of asking for some holiday because, because they thought it was going to get turned down. Um, so I guess that, that really resonated with me in terms of... And that was not, was not doing it right. Um, in terms of how I've tried to approach management. So... I guess one of the benefits that I found was having gone through the various tiers and understood the roles, I was able to kind of understand some of the frustrations that some of the team were having. Um, and when I'm starting to kind of talk about engagement and talk about engagement action plans, it's about how do I look to try and address some of the things that they were, they were talking about. But I found that going into the roles, respect, it's, it's an important word, but it's not... It's, it's earned, it's not just given. Um, and I think the fact that people had seen that I'd progressed through various roles, it really did stand me in good stead in terms of gaining that respect. Um, I think one of the important things that I found was putting myself in their shoes. So I found this particularly valuable in not only an operational manager's role, but also as a HR business partner. Um, because you really get to a bit of an understanding as to uh, kind of where they're coming from, and it's how you then start to manage that proactively. Listen, I think one of the most important uh, tools that I've learned as a manager is always to listen to your employees. If you listen, you start to learn. And if you learn, you start to change. And uh, I've found that that's been a very, very pivotal piece of um, skill, both as an operational manager, but also in a HR business partner perspective. And then setting a compelling future of vision. So, um, one of the first things I did was uh, when I came into a national field sales role was to kind of set a bit of a two-year vision as to where I wanted to take the team, what I wanted to do, and start to get that motivation tied into that, and, and, um, and it really worked for me. And then we've got celebrating success and uh, approach to learning and development. So 
Uh, celebrating success, I found, was a very, very important piece of encouraging uh, my team to, uh, to effectively go beyond what we were expecting them to do. Um, and obviously talking about the pot of money that, um, that we had, we took our team away up to Warwickshire and we had a day out where we, where we were doing um, uh, quad biking, archery, uh, you name it. We were kind of doing kind of those kind of activities. And it was all about um, celebrating what we'd achieved over the year, but also enhancing and building that, that, that team, team ethic. Um, and it's about giving people opportunity to learn about each other and what happens outside of work, learn about the families, and it really starts to kind of um, create a really good environment to work in. And then from an LND perspective, um, I, I, I set up a number of different initiatives which I'll touch on in a, in a bit, but LND has always been quite close to my heart and for me, it, in the roles that I've done, it's been important to, to see um, people develop. Oh, it's not doing it. <laughs> so what this should have shown was, um, <laughs> um, what I've done is I've taken two excerpts from our uh, employee survey. So uh, our employee survey um, is run every 18 months and we use Connexa um, to administer that and that's done across the total business. And what you should be seeing here is a split that effectively says their request at a total corporate level and then at food, uh, uh, a functional level and then commercial which was the division that I worked in and then ultimately field sales. And what, that, what it shows is, well, what it shows is the impact I think that my management style has had on my team. So you'll start to see from a favourability point of view, at the top we've got Dairy Quest with about 54% engagement. For two years on the trot, I've, I've, I've gained 90% engagement against a backdrop of a UK norm of circa 67%. Um, so it, it really worked for me um, and I was very, very proud of those results which unfortunately you can't see. Um, <laughs> so, how has my management style impacted the team? Well, um, motivation. Um, I've worked with some really, really motivated people. Um, and it's a delight to work with people that are really passionate about their job, want to do a good job, want to go that extra mile for you. Um, and you do get that return of what you get, what you put in. And I feel that my ma the way that I approached my management style gave me um, the return that um, ultimately I was looking for. We were continually improving, so it was all about how can we look to do things better? How can we look to evolve? Um, one of the things that I, I uh, did was we had a lot of um, moaning and groaning about the technology that we were using. So, uh, what it is was a benchmarking exercise that effectively went out and benchmarked what we had, which we've been using for six, seven years, sought investment from the business of circa 150k, um, and got iPhones, um, which in our business is like, wow, because <laughs> we're very backwards when it comes to IT. And it was a bit of a political hot potato because not even the CEO had an iPhone. So, um, but that made a massive difference to their, to their role. It got, a, uh, got rid of a lot of the niggles. Um, and it also brought, the technology brought the team a lot closer to our head office environment. From an ROI point of view, um, we measure ROI um, and uh, when we were a team of six, we were <coughs> about a million pound operation, the field sales team. So for every pound invested, we were, we were returning about one pound 23. By the time I'd left, we were returning two pound 30 for every pound invested. Um, from a I guess the, the, this piece here, and again, you're meant to be seeing an advert here of, um, uh, of what, something that we did in, our, in the grocer, but these kind of three tie in for me. Um, I kind of looked at the team and how can we look to try and evolve and develop the team? And uh, field sales in the commercial environment is, is kind of a, at the entry level. So um, people that want to either move into marketing or move into national accounts or supply chain, it's a great grounding for those, um, for those individuals. Um, and I initiated a, uh, I guess a bridging role that started to bridge the gap between field sales and those roles um, and introduced a development centre in which we would put people through their paces to ultimately go into those bridging roles. And that 
and resulted in 30% of the team moving into um, international accounts or supply chain or marketing. And that, that was a, a constantly evolving cycle because what it enabled us to do is to go out to the marketplace and shout about, if you want to grow your career with us, we can really, we can really make it happen. And it ultimately gave us a, a point of succession. So for every person that was moving on, we, we, had, a, we had an opportunity to kind of further, either bring someone in to, to um, uh, fill that pipeline or um, to, look, to look to move people on. So, why did I, um, why did I go into HR? Um, so I went, moved into HR about two and a half years ago. Um, and I think the real thing for me was the, the passion for the people agenda. Um, the role that I'd, uh, I'd, uh, I'd done, I'd been given an immense amount of autonomy to really kind of get hold of it and, and develop it. And, um, and it was really, um, for me, motivating to see how your approach to engaging with your staff, how it can reap benefits. Um, and <coughs> I then started to think about, okay, what's my next step? And HR seemed like a logical move to, uh, to move. So I joined uh, HR in 2012, um, and I'm a HR business partner supporting the sales, marketing, MPD, innovation, and our subsidiary businesses, um, which is MH Foods. Um, from a responsibility point of view, I um, have responsibility for an exec MD, who's a PLC board member. I have three managing directors and 19 business unit directors, and overall circuit responsibility for about 300 people. Um, I'm also part of the Demand Board of Directors, which governs, governs the strategy um, and direction of the foods business. So sitting on there, you've got Group Commercial Director, Group Marketing Director, Finance Director, Exec and myself. And uh, whilst I was doing uh, my transition to HR, I, I did my CIPD Level 7, so I spent two years doing my part-time studies. and. Um, uh, a lot of the stuff that Maureen mentioned in terms of uh, the engagement piece um, brought back a lot of memories because my, my management report was actually on employee engagement. So the Gallup and um, engaging for success were, were things that I used. So how has that background helped me in my current role? Um, I think uh, understanding people um, and building relationships are, at the, are pivotal in the role that I do. Um, they're really, really important in terms of being able to influence people, being able to get people on side, um, and I found <coughs> it's, it, it's, it's worked for me. Not everything is black and white in HR, um, and it's interesting because I work alongside someone that's come through a traditional HR route, uh, very much ER background. We have very different approaches in the way that we go about um, HR business partnering. But I think one of the things that um, I see is she can approach things very much in a black and white way and sometimes it's about understanding your stakeholder group and it's about understanding how there are going to be those elements of grey and how you can ultimately navigate through to a win-win situation particularly when it's when you're, you're looking at kind of employee relations and employment law again listening um, it's a really really important tool both in terms of trying to understand uh, some of the challenges that they have as, as management, but also what they're looking for and ultimately how you can help them. And again, put yourself in their shoes. I find that massively helps me in terms of trying to understand where they're coming from because it, it now allows me to come up with solutions that ultimately help them. And speak their language. Um, I think one of the things that's massively benefited me um, coming from a business background is, is understanding the broader business and understanding finance, understanding marketing, understanding sales and being able to engage and talk their language. Um, uh, it's really helped me. And ulti ultimately it's about navigating to a win-win situation. So I think underpinning all of this is, 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 is ultimately where you get to. <laughs> okay. Right, what, uh, I guess, oh, it has got one. So, uh, how has it, how has it um, aided me? Well, I'll, I'll talk through some of the things that I've, I've, I've worked on. And engagement has been um, a really important topic at Dairy Crest because probably over the past two, two and a half years, we've gone through an incredible amount of change. So, um, 18 months, two years ago, when I first joined uh, in HR, we went through a massive um, restructure. 
So uh, previously we'd operated as three business units. We merged those three business units into one, stripped out £10 million pounds worth of cost um, and lost a massive amount of senior management. And one of my first roles was to effectively project manage that, that project. So uh, a lot of the peers that I w was working with uh, on a senior commercial perspective, I was sat the other side of the fence telling them that they had, didn't have a job, um, which was an interesting dynamic. Um, and uh, it, 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 was, it, it taught me a lot in terms of how you approach those situations and the whole empathy and being able to be respectful, professional and ultimately if those individuals leave with a positive view on how they've been treated then, um, then that's got to be a win-win. Um, so that was the first thing. The second thing is actually that change has been continual. So we've had restructures since then and actually uh, in November of last year we announced that we're selling our dairies business to Miller Wiseman for £80 million. Pounds. So that's going to mean effectively um, circa three, 4,000 people, 3,000 people tubing across ultimately to Miller Wiseman dairies. So I've been part of a project team that effectively where we've merged three businesses into one, we're effectively now having to pull those apart and create two sustainable businesses. One is the residual dairy trust <coughs> business, the other one is the, the dairies business, which we're ultimately cheaply across. Um, and uh, it's been, from a cultural perspective, it's, it's tough at the moment. We are losing, we are losing talent. And we're finding that we haven't uh, benchmarked our package out in the marketplace. So we're trying to attract people um, from, I guess, the top tier companies, but we just don't have the benefits package to be able to go with it. So we're finding that we're having to, to bring in a lot of interims. Um, and the talent pool that we used to have um, has, has now disappeared. So it's a particularly challenging uh, environment to work in at the moment. And from a HR perspective, it's, it, I'm getting a lot of people kind of starting to think about, okay, what does my future look like? Um, and both from an individual perspective, but also from a management perspective. Um, going back to metrics, oh, uh, one of the things that I did at our MH Foods business was set up, uh, it, was a, it was a family uh, bought business um, uh, and we bought it into a more of a corporate setup um, and it's a manufacturing environment uh, and it's about how do we align the site to deliver against the objectives. So, um, so we effectively set up a bonus scheme that was linked to four, four areas, so cost, health and safety, service and quality and then effectively for office staff we had uh, personal objectives and profits. Um, and that business, when we bought it for £13 million, pounds, it had about profits of about a million quid. Um, it's now, as a brand, it's worth about £50 million and we're turning <coughs> profit-wise about four or five million quid. And it's, that has had a fundam fundamental impact in terms of the way that both management and staff have approached the business. And then I guess I'll finally leave you on the um, uh, kind of the career path thing. So one of the things that I um, well, it's been really close to my heart, and that's because I, I guess I've progressed through different various roles, is is about how do you develop your career? Um, I'm the first person in the business that's transferred across from commercial into HR. It's almost unheard of. Um, a lot of people kind of thought, why, why is he doing that? Um, but actually, it's taught me a massive amount, and and having a breadth. Of, of skill and knowledge has really, really helped me. So one of the things I look to set up um, uh, in, we call it demands, which is sales and marketing, was a, a demand career portal. Um, and effectively it was a one-stop shop for individuals as they're going into their annual uh, PDR discussion that they can start to think about, okay, where am, I, where am I at in my career at the moment? What are I'm looking to move to? What are the competences that underpin that? and where are my gaps? And then ultimately, what does that look like from an end game perspective? So it's not necessarily about going up the ladder all the time, it's about making those sideways moves to, to broaden your skill set and ultimately help you get to where, where you want to get to. And that was rolled out um, on the back of some employee engagement feedback um, from an action plan point of view. People wanted to know more about how they could develop their careers with their request. And how could the L&D provision that we have in place really help that? Um, and ironically, 
I'd launched this um, in the marketing area and literally about four weeks later we then announced that obviously we, we were selling part of our business. So unfortunately it hasn't necessarily had the level of traction that I'd wanted to, but, um, but it's certainly something that I've found has really st uh, stood me in good stead um, as I've gone through. So I want to thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope, it, hope you found it valuable and um, ho hopefully it gave you a bit of an insight into how I've tried to approach employee engagement both from a HR and an operations point of view. I'm happy to uh, take any questions. I'd like to ask you a question, if you don't mind. Um, when, when you said you had a vision, and you had like a two-year vision, um, what inspired you in that vision and how did you plan that? Um, I, so I did uh, a fair amount of networking within the industry to try and benchmark how other um, FMCG operators uh, approach field sales because a lot of them actually outsource so it's very rare for companies to have an in-house in field sales team is one of the first things that, that ultimately go. Um, and I spoke to numerous individuals about, um, okay, well, what, what, what would be a motivate, motivating vision for a territory manager? Um, and I tried to link that into the organisational objectives. So how are we going to help deliver the organisational objectives? So I had a vision, a strategy, and then a, a, a series of platforms that underpinned that, that were both linked to development, that were both linked to performance, uh, engagement, um, that ultimately helped me to, to I guess, um, <coughs> deliver that, that vision. But the, my vision was to be uh, a respected field sales team that drives development um, and drives uh, performance. Um, and it's certainly something that, that, that I found really helped. Do you think your transition from a, an operational role into HR, do you think the business influenced the perception of HR from that point in terms of your credibility? Yeah, I, I think it really helped. Um, it was a massive, if anything, um, it, I think it, certainly from a senior perspective, I think um, it really helped me develop those relationships with some of the, the senior managers um, because they'd seen that I'd been out there and I'd done it. Um, and coming back to what I was talking about in terms of being able to talk their language, from going into a, I guess, a, a, a field role to then into a boardroom in which we're talking P&Ls, in which we're talking about strategy, um, I found that I was able to hold my own because I was able to kind of talk the language that was out and about amongst the business. I, I think if I'd if I hadn't come, of, come from that background, I think I would have found it a real struggle. Yeah, I did something similar to you and I found the same thing, that you actually got an established credibility from day one, and if you were just a pure HR person looking yeah. through the door. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can I just ask, some of the issues that you brought in, you know, did you have to present a cost benefit for that? And because of your commercial background, do you find that quite straightforward to do? Um, <laughs> I guess from uh, where we've been, where we've had that investment, I have had to do a cost benefit analysis. Um, but some of, for some of the other initiatives, I've had relatively free reign, and I haven't necessarily had that level of pressure on my shoulders to say, actually, we need you to deliver X. Um, I've been given the autonomy to trial things and see how they they will embed. But some some of them, uh, yes, I have had to have a cost benefit analysis, particularly when we've been making investments of circa 100, 150k. Um, it's about how, how, how does that ultimately um, uh, deliver that for the business. And how, how do you stand up with the, with the directors as they're asking for that money? I mean, it's, it's, all, one of those you know, it's one of those difficult things to do, isn't it, to say, this is what it's going to return for you, yeah. you know, this is the benefit you're going to get out of it. Uh, for me, it's ultimately about how you pitch and how you sell, sell your story. So, um, I, I think there's, a, with a lot of the initiatives that I've delivered, there's been quite a lot of intangibility about some of the things that benefits that it will deliver for the team. So you'll have that tangible kind of, okay, for every pound it's going to return X. But there's a lot of intangibles and, and for me it's about how you um, feed those into your, your pitch um, to, I guess, add strength to, your, um, to, to, to the pitch that you're making. Because often it feels like finance directors are having to take a punt. Yes. Well, uh, you know, and that, that's, that's a really difficult thing to yeah, yeah. do. Yes. Yeah, particularly in our, <laughs> uh, Yeah, we're a very finance driven business, so it can be very, very um, challenging at times to uh, try and get that level of investment. And I have to say, more so, more recently, it's, it's becoming even more challenging. Mm -hmm. 
interested what you said about your HR colleague um, maybe being more black and white. Yeah. Um, it's interesting when I was in HR, I thought I was quite supportive of employees. But I realise now I'm working with patients and employees that actually I could have been more supportive and listened to them a bit more to understand and maybe yeah. not follow such a black and white process. And so have you had any influence with your other HR colleagues to kind of change that perspective a bit? It's, 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 uh, it's an interesting one because um, I work very closely in terms, of, in terms of proximity. I literally sit opposite this person and um, we sit in an office, there's just the two of us um, and literally our, our office is like doctor's surgery in terms of stakeholders coming in and out. And it's quite interesting to observe the, the, the different ways in which we approach. Um, and I think her view of, of, of uh, the way that I approach things is probably that I, I probably need to be a little bit harder um, with my stakeholders. But then on the flip side, I would say that in some respects she's too hard in that she, she puts that resistance up straight away and, and, and stakeholders disengage. Uh, and she, she kind of wonders why she doesn't necessarily get the results she was looking for. So I think we, we learn from each other um, uh, and we have had those conversations about, okay, so I've just seen you do that. How, Tell, tell me about it. What, what have you found has worked for you? And I think the blend of the two has, has actually helped both of us. Hi, um, you talked earlier on about the impact that um, a very authoritarian manager had on you. Yeah. Do you also have inspirational managers where you sort of build up your own stuff? Yeah, um, my uh, group commercial director um, is probably one of the best bosses that I've worked for. Um, because uh, has anyone done insights um, in the room? Um, he was very much a red, a red blue, um, and I'm kind of a yellow, yellow green blue kind of person. So he really had to kind of develop his style to suit mine, and I had to do the reverse. Um, but I found him to be an inspiration in terms of the way that he presented himself in the business, how hard he works, the results that he achieved. I mean, having to go into battle with some of these retailers um, when they've got you over a barrel, I mean, it's, it's no mean feat, and, and he does this on a daily basis. Um, but amongst his commercial approach, he had people at his heart, uh, and, it, and for him it was all about the team, and it's about how can the team help to deliver the overall business strategy and business goals. And um, he has now gone to succeed our exec MD and has, has now become exec MD for, for the business. And I think it's credit to the way that he's approached um, both uh, the management of the team but also the way that he's approached business, I think, has, has really helped him. And for me, um, I've, yeah, I, I've used him as a mentor. So ever since, I mean, I support him as a stakeholder, but I, I, I use him and I go to him in terms of just wanting to bounce things off. He's been very, very um, useful for me in terms of what my next career steps look like. Mm. I really like um, this quad biking idea. <laughs> <laughs> Rewarding team success where I work, it's very much um, individuality reward. Yeah. Uh, and I've come from a teaching background where we reward everybody, whether they do anything or not, it, it seems. So my question is, um, how did other teams feel that that didn't get that reward. Yeah, it's, it's an it is an interesting one because um, particularly when I mean we're not flush with cash, um, but we do put put monies into the budget to be able to do that. Um, and within a commercial environment, it's kind of part and parcel of what we do. But I guess if I was to speak to my finance colleagues or even my HR colleagues, it's kind of non-existent. So. Um, you have to approach it in a very, very sensitive manner, but um, but I think it's important that you tie it back to the results that you ultimately deliver. And, and actually, if we're a results-driven business, investing a day, taking the team off to celebrate success, it is really, really important. Um, and I don't think you can really put a number on 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 how um, on on how successful that can be. Um, and actually we have started to see the likes of the finance, it hasn't quite reached HR yet, but the finance colleagues have started to go off and have kind of off-site days. Um, particularly as we've been going through periods of change, that team ethic and being able to kind of keep the team together has been really important. Can I just ask when you 
spoke about the raising engagement scores um, when you were a manager. Did did other managers come to you and say, how did you do that? Or was there any way of sharing that best practice within the organisation? Yes, yeah, so I did um, um, with some of my fellow commercial colleagues and in marketing. Um, I, I spent some time going around and speaking to them about how I approached um, how I approached kind of our action planning. So going back to what Maureen was saying earlier on, um, the way that I approached engagement was we, we were given the scores, we were given the results, but for me it was about the team completed those those uh, engagement surveys. So ultimately they're telling me something. So either what's working or what's not working, and it's about how do I get them engaged in terms of the output from what that plan looks like. So it wasn't me kind of top down saying, well, actually, this is this is what it's saying, so therefore we need to do this. Actually, they were the ones that derived the output and, and the action plan. And that actually had a fundamental impact on the last um, employee survey that we did, because rather than a top down approach from CEO and management board, we actually said, well, actually, we're not going to do that. We'll go from the bottom up. Um, and start to see what the things are before the management board then set, set obviously what the agenda was going to be. So um, I found it was a it was an approach that really worked for me, and it's been something that's been adopted.